This is Keys to the Shop, episode 431, an exercise in listening to coffee with Alexander Roach of Boycott Coffee. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFurio. I'm your host for the show, and thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. Please do subscribe to the show. Just hit subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast, be that on YouTube or any of the podcast players out there that carry keys to the shop, which should pretty much be all of them. And that way you'll always be updated with new content as it comes out. And also, if you would, share these episodes with your friends, with your colleagues, or with your team. Somebody out there can be helped by the great things that guests of Keys to the Shop talk about, whether that's their stories of coming into coffee and starting their businesses, their expertise in different subjects regarding leadership and management and operations. It's all just a real wealth of information that I would love to see spread around more. And the primary way to do that is sharing keys to the shop. So thank you everybody who's already taking that on. I really appreciate you all. Now, Keys to the Shop is not just a podcast. Keys to the Shop also offers consulting and coaching for you and your business. Well, what that looks like with Keys to the Shop Consulting is you get to work one-on-one with me in coaching sessions that walk you through leveling up your operations, people, and quality in your coffee shop. Or I've got lots of clients who are opening their first coffee shop. And we're walking through that process as well to help them get started on the right foot. All in all, it's been such a great honor to work with so many of you out there, listeners to the show, building your businesses and improving your businesses. And I love being able to get into the the details and in depth to find solutions for people who are trying to create magic in their coffee shops. And so if that is interesting to you, if you want to work with Keys to the Shop Consulting and just want to have a conversation about what that would look like, go ahead and email chris at keys to the shop.com. That's C-H-R-I-S at keys to the shop.com. And we'll set up a free discovery call and talk all about how I might be able to help you through Keys to the Shop Consulting. Again, chris at keys to the shop.com. Now, I find it really fascinating that in every coffee shop, we are presented with options that explore the depth and range of the coffees that we offer. When we do this, we are relying on the coffee to showcase the best that it has to the customer so that they can form an opinion about that coffee. That opinion turns into how you know the market looks and that in turn feeds how things go on the farm. And so presenting coffee in its best possible light is so important uh, to create that great first impression. You can't just rely on conventional coffee brewing to do that. You need some innovation to really optimize your coffee Innovative technology has come to the rescue in the form of the Ground Control Cyclops Brewer. The Ground Control Cyclops Brewer uses SEA award-winning technology to give you control over the depth and range of every coffee on your menu. So it not only is a amazing batch brewer, but the extraction technology allows you to make batched ice lattes, batched cold brew, tea, So this opens up a whole bunch of categories for profitability, efficiency, and of course, a level up in quality. So go check them out over at groundcontrol.coffee and learn more about this amazing piece of equipment. And if you're looking for an upgrade in quality, more options for profitability on the menu, more efficiency, and just to look great doing it because it's a beautiful machine as well, then you should be using a ground control Cyclops Brewer in your shop. Go ahead, check them out again over at groundcontrol.coffee. Now, as many of you know, I got my start in coffee competitions actually in latte art. And at the time there wasn't very many options for plant-based beverages. These days, the average barista is pouring probably more plant-based beverages through basically things like almond and oat and those uh, mainstays and other, maybe sometimes coconut and it might, your mileage may vary, but you get it. You get that this is a huge category for most coffee shops now. So a lot has changed and so have the options. But one of the things that has not changed is the beauty and dependability of the barista series from Pacific. This is the line of plant-based performance beverages that is designed for 
baristas and tested by baristas, approved by baristas before the product is even put onto the shelves. So you know it stands up to the heat from steaming, produces amazing silky texture, perfect for latte art, and also keeps the balance of the beverage focused on the coffee. So I definitely think that you should check them out over at pacificfoodservice.com, get samples and try it for yourself. If you truly want to serve your customers the best plant-based beverages, I think you need to try the Barista Series from Pacific. All right, everybody. Well, today we are going to be talking with somebody who is taking on the experience of coffee from a new angle. And it's something that I personally think is really cool. Today, we're talking with Alexander Roach. Since 2010, Alexander has worked behind coffee bars in both Memphis and Seattle. And uh, during that time, he has ventured into owning and operating a cafe and roastery called Boycott Coffee in Memphis, Tennessee. Now, the current project that he is working on is called the Alphabet Book of Coffee, which is an independent project with a goal to produce an audio tasting series that gives people an out-of-the-box exercise in how they consume and share coffee narratives. This is produced as a, a subscription that goes along the alphabet from A to Z, and the audio is presented on cassette tapes. And it is very cool. I mean, I'm talking as a person who grew up with cassette tapes, you know, 45 years old is near and dear to my heart, but it is a fresh way of approaching interacting with coffee and listening to the stories of what's behind the cup. And Alexander has been doing a great job uh, with the packaging, with the promotion, and as an educator, you know, Alexander is also a teacher by trade. This is something we dive into. We talk about how learning happens. We talk about communication and the scope of this project and what it means for how we share information with a consumer and how consumers actually consume information. And so through this conversation, we get to learn about marketing, communication, and how we can keep things fresh for people as we want them to uh, really grasp the right things in the coffee narrative. And this Alphabet Book of Coffee series is a great example of a creative way to do just that. So I hope you really enjoy this conversation. I definitely did. Here now is my interview with Alexander Roach. Alexander, welcome to Keys to the Shop. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, it feels like a long time coming because I've been following your journey with Boycott Coffee over the years and now with the Alphabet Series, ABCs. It's called the Alphabet Series, right? It's the Alphabet Book of Coffee, ABC. Yes, I love it. And it just is very aesthetically pleasing to me as somebody who I, I myself am vintage, <laughs> the, <laughs> the aesthetic and everything. But the idea is really great. And you've always took a stance, I think, with how you present information through boycott that has been, feels like born from your own experiences in coffee, the way you view the industry at large and what you want to do in Memphis. So maybe a good place to start before diving into this series, this subscription service, is where did you first develop your first philosophy on coffee in the industry? Was it at Boycott? Was it before Boycott? Where did this all begin for you? My professional with coffee really began in college at Starbucks. Whether I developed any sort of like value system or philosophy, I don't know. It was mostly just operating like a machine just to get through the day. But I definitely carried a lot of things that I learned from working in a corporate environment into the specialty scene, which didn't start for me until I had a brief living stint in Seattle. So I was able to actually work with a little bit more, obviously more established than Memphis was, a coffee scene there. Mm -hmm. And even then it was still very, not corporate driven, but it was a job. And it really took me working at a cafe that featured a local roaster that started kind of sharing with me how they interacted with the value chain as I came to understand it. And so it was about five years of working in coffee before I actually started to understand where I was working. And through that, just interacting with more people who kind of guided me through that understanding. As far as developing any sort of like values or philosophy, I think it just came from 
initially just being frustrated with how things were packaged and presented, not physically, but just how we were communicating the product. And I think a lot of people were frustrated, you know, or have been frustrated with the shallow nature of being part of a commercial service while still celebrating the people behind it or aiming to celebrate the people behind it in order to really just package or promote that product. Even now, it's tough for me to put into words. I definitely couldn't do it then. And I was able to meet, after moving back into Memphis, people like Bartholomew Jones of Coffee Black, who was also getting his SAR off the ground, working with my now co-owners, April Mundy and Mercedes Birch, who really kind of helped me kind of just vent any frustration I did have. Those two or three were the ones who helped me see what I was feeling on an emotional level or what I, how I was interacting with this industry and how to put it into words or how to put it into action. And that's what birthed Boycott Coffee, ultimately. Okay, yeah. And now that journey of starting Boycott Coffee from somebody who has been wrestling with their perspective on not only your place in the industry, but the position of a professional on the consuming end of things, on the service end of things, our position in the industry. What is your hope for Boycott? What was it that you were trying to do through it that would help channel those things that you were kind of feeling that tension around? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely changed from where it initially was. 2018, 2019, when Boycott became a thing, mostly just a social media, not even brand, but just kind of another account. It was primarily focused on the other side of that supply chain. And at the time, it wasn't a new idea. It was just something that was, these concepts or these topics weren't as accessible as they are now, thanks to a lot of companies really stepping up, a lot of brands really stepping up to communicate the issues that we're seeing, um, whether that be with price fluctuations, corporate, not necessarily greed, but influence, power struggles, those dynamics, and then really looking at things and compartmentalizing them, not just as this linear line, but being able to see the complexities across each region. And so that was something that we weren't really doing a good job about promoting, but it was something we wanted to emulate as Boycott became a team. And knowing that we would probably end up becoming a brick and mortar to supplement that, you know, like, well, how do we actually perform in this industry without being part of it? We were already roasting coffee at the time. We were already kind of doing pop-ups and we were able to find a location. That has since moved on as we learned about our skill set and what our voice was in the industry and that are we fit or is it appropriate for us to represent voices that we don't even talk to, you know, beyond just making a purchase request for green coffee or anything like that. So we started to really just try to alter our message in a way that was representative of the people that we actually understood and could interact with. And that became the labor force on the consumer side of things. And so more barista labor struggle awareness, uh, more placemaking awareness as we look at how urban environments are changing and centered around commerce and how coffee shops play either a good or a bad role in that. And so we felt that while we might not be able to, whether it's ethically, but definitely not credibly promote or discuss things that are happening on the more production or producer side of things. From a consumer level and the opposite end of the value chain, that's where we were and that's where we were working. And so it shifted to now talking about still labor, but labor that is much more customer facing or consumer facing, I guess. Because that's what you do and you can identify with it and you feel more of a legitimate claim to represent that particular part of the value stream on your end. Absolutely. A much better and more succinct way to say that than I just did, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, nothing is easy, you know, and I mean, you're an educator and you know that you can have philosophies and concepts and delivering those in a way that people will get in the moment can be done whether they get them and understand them and it changes what they do and how they think and what they create from that point forward is another one. Funny enough, you're actually taking this call, uh, should be noted in a, uh, I think a high school or elementary school, elementary school. Yeah. In a hallway. So you're, you're like skipping class to do this. Yeah. I'm sneaking around. So <laughs> don't tell my students, but you know, the, the idea of taking what you can do 
and applying it the way you have, I think is credible and commendable because that we need thinkers. We need people to suss out ideas in the industry, but we also need people to take those ideas and apply them to in a way that can be consumed. So I'm glad you're, you're doing that. And now you've got this project, the Alphabet Book of Coffee, that started a little bit ago, didn't it? Because I saw a little rumblings of letter series, maybe like last year. Oh, wow. Thanks for staying in, in tune with that. Yeah. So on my personal Instagram account, I was just kind of just messing around. And honestly, it was kind of more of a, a healthy thing for me to do just to kind of wean myself off of posting or interacting on social media. And so I was like, I just need to have some controlled frequency of involvement here. And as a English teacher, you know, the alphabet is already kind of, there's only 26 English letters. And so, yeah, the series just kind of came from, well, I want to communicate about coffee and I can do that on a kind of a content topic based thing. And if I organize that topic or those topics alphabetically, what would that look like? And so each post was one letter that had topical words associated with it. It was fun for a minute and it became very dutiful and, uh, and lost a lot of attention very quickly, which is fine. It definitely put things into a frame for me as to what I knew people found to be important and what was worth sharing or addressing, even if it was just in a bite-sized form, but also what I understood as far as the coffee industry and what terms or notes I could put out. But yeah, so that was the personal series and that definitely influenced what's happening now. So what is happening now? Describe this for us. Yeah, really it's, it accomplishes a lot of things for me. Bare Bones, it is a coffee subscription series that is organized alphabetically. And what's organized is two things. One is different coffees. So from A through Z, B just got launched, B for Burundi, and then we'll just go on and on from there. It might not just be categorized by region. It could be categorized by processing method or what have you. And that's half of the series. The other half, which comes in the form of a cassette, is really just content. And it's content that is packaged in an audio form that is delivered by experts, not me. So it's interviewing coffee business owners, producers, farmers, educators, and things like that, or people outside of coffee who are also closely related to audio manufacturing, production, anything that might have to, or that could be considered incorporated into the coffee industry. Yeah. What's the goal? Well, to finish, that's the big one. So I'm only two tapes in and already it's, yeah, it's, it's not exhausting, but it is work. To complete the goal, there's a finish line. It's Z. And so we're releasing these bi-weekly which means that I have a year cut out for me. Yeah. I mean, it's already, you know, there's 52 weeks in a year. We cut that in half. There's your 26 letters. <laughs> so it, it works out. The math works out really well. Nice. Yeah, you're halfway there, at least compared to what Sufjan Stevens tried to do. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, an album that's still better than what I could do in 26, though. But, yeah, I mean, the goal ultimately is to kind of make up for a lot of lost time that I've had. You know, I've been doing or working in and out of coffee since 2010. And after 13 years, it feels like there was a lot of experiences and voices left on the table, whether that's because of the environment I was in or the decisions that I've made professionally. There are a lot of things that have felt missed. And definitely a big part of that is the interaction that I wish I did have. And now that I'm really pushing to have with people who either have some notoriety or people I know that have a lot that they can share within the industry. And so it is a very personal project, but I'm packaging it in a way where it's hopefully enjoyed and benefiting to people who you know, wanna taste and listen. And this presentation of information in a cassette form, I mean, they're basic, they're interviews. I mean, this is a podcast in a sense, but it's more akin to the kind of information that people would, you know, pop in their cassette players in their car to learn, you know, money mastery <laughs> right. and uh, yeah. the 
the the 80s box sets of success tapes and and other things too like i'm sure national geographic had you know cassette series on exploring the savannah and all that stuff so it feels like a more opportune environment for learning because in order to enjoy a cassette you've got to find a player and you're going to focus on that. Yeah, it's there's some investment that you want to get out of it. Touching back on those other uses, I mean, as an ESL teacher, there was kind of this desire to, how can I communicate in the future with language learners? It's morphed, obviously, into this thing, but that was the initial impulse was, you know, education in my mind should be at cost, if not free. But as an educator, how do you support yourself? How do you ensure longevity of whatever institution you're trying to create? And a product or some way to make something more engaging and enjoyable is a really great way to do that. And you can receive some type of hopeful financial restitution for that in some way. So, you know, creating this in a way that's how can I justify charging or putting in a box something that is information that one can be acquired, maybe not freely in the same unique tailored fashion, but information that I do believe should be highly accessible. But in order for this project to exist, there needs to be some sort of backing. And so pairing it with coffee, pairing it with a product that can be consumed along with this you know, eventual very condensed library of information, that's kind of what it's become, I guess. Yeah. I'm dating myself here. The book it programs that used to be, exist in the the 90s and 80s, where you would get like a personal pan pizza if you read so many books over the summer mm -hmm. uh, at Pizza Hut, and I did, and I am proud of that. <laughs> and so, it, it, almost more than my my latte art you know, stuff. But anyway, the idea that there is some kind of a tangible reward for your investment into this educational pursuit makes that educational pursuit holistic almost in, you know, the philosophy of, of that may just be that it's easy for me to listen. If you go back into your history and see how many YouTube videos or podcasts or things you've listened to in the last week, and then think about how much you remember from that, you probably don't, <laughs> I mean, just straight up. But if I took time to put a cassette or something on vinyl, if it was music. Yeah, right. Uh, I am poised and ready to receive this information a little bit more because I'm invested a little bit more. Yeah, it, it does block out, interesting enough, noise just because it is the approach of, like you're saying, making it more of a ritualistic kind of experience. The design of it, it's so brief on either side. So no one's getting a 60 minute cassette, but it's mm -hmm. five minutes on one, five minutes on the other, five minutes of information on side A. And then on the next side, it's music and brewing tips. And so the plan is that while someone has 40 grams or two cups worth of coffee, that they can learn about it and then also hopefully get the best they can out of it with such a very, very slim window of success uh, when it comes to brewing. So I try to incorporate those brewing guides or instructions or tips so that people can have something tasty out of it. Mm -hmm. Well, this is educational for people who have brands, who claim values, and I do have, I won't say claim, that's a little negative. I, I'd say they have values, but don't necessarily know how to walk it out in the day-to-day. -day. Doing something like what you've done to think outside the box to do something that is creative in that it will hack the system of people's learning, if you will. Not to sound too clickbaity with, with that, but we always talk about educating the consumer with, I think, the idea that the education of the consumer will help transform the industry if they were just educated. But oftentimes that just comes with the you know presentation of information of, of all kinds, but maybe not curated information. And so, uh, maybe a question I, I'd like for you to speak to is if we're going to curate messaging and in information to consumers that would allow for a more efficient walking out of a more sustainable supply stream, what do you think we should spend our time communicating and in investing into helping people really grab a hold of? I really think what you've mentioned about how we have come to absorb information and content 
And this might be, you know, maybe not the antithesis of that, but definitely a lot more dialed back. There is something to say about, you know, and I've learned this about myself and just kind of how I've worked with Boycott and even coming up with this project is that content like this or information like this that is really going to reshape this industry and other industries, it has to be a shared effort and responsibility. And I do think it's not necessarily easy, but we are very, I think, formulaic with our approaches when it comes to marketing messages, whether that be talking about one centralized idea and either elevating one perspective and muting others or, or not. But something that I would want to encourage is just finding a way without it being too noisy or just incoherent to have a collection of these voices and perspectives that cover a wide breadth of information. So I don't know what I will find or what we'll learn from this. I tend to focus or try to find people to spend their time in an interview. And in that interview, I might have a particular direction that I'd like it to go in. But I've learned, and I'm sure anyone who's listening to this can learn that I, I ramble a lot. And so I'm usually shown unexpected ideas from the people that I'm, I'm talking with. So I don't know if this is really answering your question at all. I think you have answered the question in so far as that noise element of the messaging is what causes consumers to just completely glaze over. There's so much. And when I'm communicating, and I'll do this in interviews too sometimes, if I don't have a great, I have an idea of what the question is, but I'll ask it in such a way that's so convoluted and long, the guest will be like, what? Uh, well, see, what's the question again? <laughs> and so as an industry, mm -hmm. I think consumers might be asking us that very thing. Like, well, what is it that you wanted us to remember again? That specialty is, is it, or the farmer is, or the, bar the barista, because we're not able to, <laughs> <laughs> we're saturated in a sense. So yeah, I suppose it is a matter of being patient maybe with less and making that less more effective? Yeah, I think so. And what I probably have learned that is the best way for me to actually conduct these interviews is kind of just giving people more of the floor, kind of just tell me what I should know or kind of working backwards really with, hey, I've got these subscribers or I've got these consumers, or I've got these customers kind of not locked in, but they're here. I'm a vessel. I've got this box and I've got this packaging and I've got all these things, but I don't know what the substance should be. And then I just kind of point it at someone who's going to be featured on the tape. And what should the substance be? And they kind of offer up based on how everything is kind of put together. And so, yeah, already with these past two, there's been an unexpected direction. And I've learned that, you know, even though I, I want things in a frame, designing these questions or designing this information is going to only limit, I think, the project. So it's been very as free form as I can get. Yeah, so far so good. Well, free form is even when we are trying to be just outlandish, outside the box, free form, we're still obeying the laws of nature and that kind of thing. So even in the pursuit of allowing somebody to guide you, they're emerges some kind of a form that is the coalescence, if you will, <laughs> of what is on the mind of thinkers and innovators and, and the people that you're choosing is itself the curation process. I mean, that is your influence on it. That is true. The buck stops with me ultimately. Yeah. And so what was surprising for you then? You said that it had taken a turn that you didn't know it would go and in yeah, I'm interested to hear an example of that. Very literally, when it comes to how I've learned how I interview, is that I think I'm drawn to people who I know don't need me to say anything, or I have seen that they've already established a voice. And so I think the surprising element with that has been my expectation has usually, or has so far, been met with a different idea or perspective from them. And so recently I was able to interview a neighbor, a local Memphian, uh, Bartholomew Jones for Coffee Black. And I went in and going like, we're going to talk about X, Y, and Z, because this person has been talking about X, Y, and Z for five, six years now. And a lot of it was that. But then there were very 
strong glimpses of new perspectives based on new experiences that this person has had that it completely reshaped what I had already pictured that interview or that cassette to be about. And so, while yeah, I am drafting this plan and have some early expectation, the surprise has been that I'm getting a different idea or a different or how how it's still able to shift and evolve, even though I've I think have boxed myself into a corner when it comes to each letter. Yeah. But you know, it's a challenge that if you're freestyling it, you know, there's a lot of words that start with those letters. Yeah. So you can <laughs> I'm sure you could find your way around. That's true. So now when you have these messages going out and people are brewing and listening and processing the information, what would you say? And they, maybe this is something that crosses over into your role in teaching English as well. Applying that information or once you hit stop on the player, you have it in your head now. I mean, what, what happens after that where we don't lose that information? We can listen to it again, but what's the walking out that maybe you yourself would do? If you're listening to your own project, the way that somebody who's, you know, consuming it, what do you do with that information to make it real? Yeah. I mean, the nature of cassettes or how they were used, and I'm definitely on the far tail end of those being in circulation. I'm 30, about to be 33. So I was part of kind of the CD transitioning to MP3 was already happening, you know, by the time I was in elementary school. So, but... Cassettes were something that were still had high cultural relevance as it was being essentially phased out. Even what I saw at home, my dad is an audio engineer, and I didn't see a struggle between the switch of format. I think he appreciated that one was superior than the other. But I think there was this apprehension to something becoming, you know, antiquity or a novelty because the way that this cassette culture was being brought up was this concept of sharing and creating mixes of things that you enjoyed. And you were hoping to put that out into whether it's your small community or put it out to the masses and being able to have something reciprocated back to you. And so there's this small inkling of that cassette culture that I would really like to resonate here where what something does when they stop will hopefully it's to share that or remix it with their own voice and say, well, okay, well, I understand that perspective, but here's mine. And to find a way to reiterate that. And so, because I think I don't want there to be this note that what's in the box is the definitive example of how this topic should be packaged and introduced. And so already there's been, I won't say aggressive comments or discussions, but there's been opposing ideas to concepts which we're conditioned and have been on social media to either ignore or address. I think hopefully there's this kind of sensation that the person is now being invited to either continue to listen to this idea or to create something new with it and give them kind of a audio bedrock for making something else to share. I like that idea. The community of coffee does this with things that they gravitate toward, they become passionate about. You know, I'm a, a head judge for latte art competition at the coffee fest, and you see this sharing of information on Instagram, or or people will have their own little local throwdowns, but also they will just be in each other's messages to help with this because they know the they have maybe a perspective that somebody else doesn't who's right in the midst of all of that practice if it's something akin to talking about value streams and or equity in farming or things like that i love the idea that there would be a sharing of a cassette or the a sharing of your ideas on that and i will i will say to anybody listening if you subscribe to Alexander's project, which you should, they don't cost a lot to get something that can actually record your voice to a cassette and put it in circulation. I will say there was a VHS back in the day of the Zoka way, was, you know, Cafe Zoka or in uh, Seattle, of how to be a barista. And there was some of us online who were, I guess, illegally uh, circulating this, 
<laughs> VHS across the country to each other's houses. And boy, that would be really interesting to see people mailing cassettes around or even recording like their own voices as a response to that. What a really grassroots way to s start a discussion that hasn't been done before. Yeah, I mean, just from a technical standpoint, when I first purchased the cassettes for letter A, you know, because I'm hoping that, you know, whether each one has a different color or whatever, doesn't necessarily matter. But my impulse was to buy, a lot of people might not know this who are listening, but there's pins at the top of a cassette that either allow you to record or if they're removed, you cannot record them on top of them. And so my impulse was, well, I don't want someone to record over this. But the more, you know, like this next round, um, there's a little bit more gap that this idea of exactly what we're talking about. Well, what if someone was able to add a comment and they were like, hey, here's a cassette that I purchased from the series. By the way, you know, you can hear my response to it in the last like 30 seconds of it or something. And so while that could be like dangerous, yeah, I do think creating or evolving this to be this kind of like eventual mixtape reusable format would be really cool. I mean, that's what these cassettes were designed to do anyway. Right on. Yeah. And so sparking conversation and offering people the vote of confidence that your thoughts are needed in the midst of this conversation, because here's an authority culture. If there ever was one, you have taken the step to create a project. I have a podcast. Somebody else has a YouTube channel. Oh, they're the person, right? Well, you started a coffee shop. You must be a coffee expert. And I'm sure that everybody in your family believes that is true because nobody would go that far with something as mundane as this. And even within our own industry, it's hard for us to believe that what we have in our heads could actually make a difference in something seemingly as large as the topics covered in a podcast or on a cassette tape about pricing structures or consumerism and, and that kind of stuff. How would you help people overcome their inhibition to jump into the conversation? I'm not saying they need to pretend to know something that they don't, but to begin being involved means you have to take a little risk, right? Yeah. And this is definitely these past few years for sure for I mean, anyone and everyone has definitely made, I think, a lot of people apprehensive to taking risk. We're very headstrong about being in either a sustainable phase or a recovery phase these past few years. And so encouraging anything that would be considered maybe creative on one side but impulsive to the next is tough. It's a tough ask mm -hmm. to just have people just kind of throw this newly developed instinct of security or desire for more security and less more about dreaming and creative pursuit. I think we were conditioned to kind of just, you know, like not to be afraid of failure or being shot down or anything like that. But we've learned quickly that like failure is not really the scariest thing. It's the anticipation of how it's going to feel when you land or when you hit the ground. And we've all really hit our own grounds pretty hard, I think, lately. Mm. And the varying recovery rate is what we still are very uncertain of. You know, am I going to get back to where I was? Am I going to ascend even more? Or am I kind of idling below a threshold of comfort? It's, you know, debilitating to try to say, hey, while you're, you know, you have these fears or these new self-preservation tactics, go ahead and put yourself out there and your opinion out there to be then warmly received or criticized. It's really just leveraging an appreciation for people's capacity to become involved and not so much so that uh, this hyper pressure, the only way to really interact with this project is to therefore deliver something back to it. And so I'm more than comfortable with someone just absorbing something. And if they want to address how they feel about it or their level of impact towards it and can appreciate that production, then yeah, being able to open up and still Maybe this could become a platform for that. I don't know. No, I like that. And we are conditioned, I think, in some ways to wait until we have a little bit more of a guaranteed success and the return on the investment to, to enter in. So that muscle of consuming things is way stronger than the muscle of processing what we consume or even saying, I have 
maybe some questions and I don't want to ask them because I feel like they're dumb questions. Not even just contribution, but learning itself and asking their questions and allowing yourself to feel foolish, which is different than being foolish, right. yeah. you know, <laughs> is critical, right? Because so many people will postulate and posture themselves, but not very many are really learning. And, and, and that's what I'm excited for in, in regards to this project. I think that it's really cool and the way it's being delivered and thought through and also allowed to have a, a life of its own, as we've talked about this here, means a lot, you know? So really well done. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. How can we learn more about the Alphabet Book of Coffee project? Well, yeah, first and foremost, Instagram has been the bread and butter for all of this. That directs you to the website, which is the same name, Alphabet Book of Coffee. And so that's where all the updates will happen. Sweet. Alexander, thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate all that you're doing, and it's great to meet you, and uh, thanks for your insights. Yeah, thank you. Okay, everybody. Well, I hope you really enjoyed that conversation. One of the main takeaways, for me at least, is that we can optimize the environment in which communication takes place by curating conversations and talking points to the things that are imp not only important to us, but also translate to uh, send a message to others that is going to transform the way that they view what it is we're serving them and who is behind what we're serving them. This is a huge part of our role as representatives of coffee, as baristas, as roasters, as professionals, being creative about the way we communicate and maybe upending people's expectations and sometimes circumventing their defenses, you know, in this idea of a cassette tape that plays in it's in an environment that is relatively distraction free. I mean, all the sensory things that are going on in that moment are actually working to help the information absorb rather than be deflected. And so I think it's a really cool project. Again, thank you to Alexander for joining us on the show. If you want more information about this, go ahead and follow along over on Instagram. Alphabet Book of Coffee is the handle, at Alphabet Book of Coffee. And then also check out the website, alphabetbookofcoffee.com. And of course, Boycott Coffee in Memphis. If you're around the area and you want some great coffee from people who are putting a lot of intentionality behind their work, check them out. Boycottcoffee.com and on Instagram at Boycott Coffee. Now, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback for me about today's episode, feel free to reach out. Chris at keys to the shop.com. That's where you can reach out for an email. If you're interested in the keyholder coaching groups that have been started uh, or are starting, the applications are closed for this one that's actually happening in the next week. All of the applications that have been considered, the first group has been selected, and I'm really excited about launching this. The next group is going to be opening up early next year in 2024 it sounds like a long way away but it's actually not it's going to be around the around april or so if you want to be considered for that send me an email go ahead and uh, reach out chris at keys to the shop.com and i will put your name on a list to send some early registration notifications that is a mastermind group of five to seven people who are coffee shop owners all dedicated to helping each other thrive working through problems and finding solutions and celebrating wins and generally we just being there for one another through the process and journey of creating great coffee spaces again that's chris at keys to the shop.com for the uh, key holder coaching groups now i'm super excited because coming up in orlando in november is coffee fest it is the last show of 2024 if you don't know about coffee fest it is pretty much the best trade show you can go to if you want to be equipped with a range of resources and information to run a great coffee shop. And it's been doing this for 30 years. Coffeefest.com is where you can learn more information about this wonderful show. I've been doing this show pretty much nonstop since 2004. So I'm quite familiar with you know what goes on there. I'm a head judge for Coffee Fest Latte Art. I've you know, been a latte art competitor for a while when I first got started, a teacher and instructor. And these days I am, like I said, judging latte art, but I'm also presenting lectures. And so are a lot of other people, you know, they're subjects like finances, employee culture, hiring, drink preparation. It just runs the gamut. And so 
Again, coffeefest.com is where you can learn more about the upcoming show in Orlando. You can use the code KEYS, K-E-Y-S, to get 50% off your general admission registration. And uh, I really hope to see you there. Orlando is going to be a blast, and it'd be a shame if you weren't there to have a blast with us at Coffee Fest. Check them out again at coffeefest.com. And with that, that is the end of our episode, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me. As usual, couldn't do it without you. And this show is here for your edification and equipping. And I'm so grateful for what is you know, basically now seven years of Keys to the Shop. And uh, yeah, have a great one. Don't forget to subscribe to the show. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you Keys to the Shop. <laughs>